It's slower, battery life isn't as good. They don't have the three cameras, they don't have their ultra wide, they can't take macro photos. It costs more too. What is this really adding to your life? <laughs> Four years ago, somewhere in this square, the first ever UK mobile phone call was made by a guy called Michael Harrison on the Vodafone BT1. Ahoy, ahoy. But how did we get from that to this? The iPhone Air. iPhone Air. iPhone Air. iPhone Air. Getting my hands on this phone made me wonder, how did they get this thin? I think it comes down to Apple resizing and reshaping all the components within this phone. They've also done a lot of considerations about how the different parts work together. We want to talk about the four main design decisions that they made and then one overarching guiding goal for this product. This is Patrick. He worked on the Phone 3 and is an expert at building phones. Let's start with the frame, probably the main structural component for the phone. They've made this outer frame out of titanium. I mean, you would use titanium when you build rocket ships, race cars, you know, you need like a high performance material. So titanium, it has a better strength to weight ratio and also strength to volume ratio than alu. So when you have like a block of titanium for the same size block, it'd be much harder to bend or break it. But an interesting thing that they've done is chosen to go with aluminium for this inner middle section. The main reason they've done that, I think, is for heat dissipation. Heating is a, is a big problem with, I think, mobile devices. You're packing all this compute and all these electronics into a tiny space. So for example, for like the Nothing Phone 3 to manage this, you have a vapor chamber here to draw heat away from the battery and from the main board. There's no vapor chamber in this phone, but they've chosen to use Alley, which has a better heat conductivity. This Alley really helps pull like, the heat away better than the titanium would. Using the structural strength of titanium, so you don't need too much material on the outside to keep the phone thin, but you still get that kind of rigid design. But then using aluminium as an almost like passive way of heat dissipation, as you mentioned, as opposed to something like a vapor chamber. There's a lot of chat on the internet about a 3D printed part. Is that in the back panel? No, actually in this frame, they've 3D printed this USB-C port holder at the bottom. It's a really interesting decision. This is what a 3D printed USB cover made from PLA would look like. To print a titanium part, Apple likely used a printing process called PBF, something we've seen in other industries like bicycle manufacturing, and actually Huawei used on their Honor Magic V2 and V3. But why exactly would Apple choose to 3D print this very specific part for their iPhone Air? that allows you to get these more complex geometries than you could get with subtractive manufacturing. I think that helps them create like thinner parts and lighter parts, such as this USB-C port. You can also see here, there's this really big, shiny metal thing, which I'm guessing is a battery. Yeah, this battery in the iPhone Air, it's huge. It takes up so much space inside the phone. So these are like more of the conventional batteries that you see inside of a mobile phone. It's surrounded by a thin layer of alu foil compared to this, which is like a thicker steel casing. For this, you can think of this like steel case battery as sort of serving a dual purpose. With the battery out of the phone, the frame is actually a lot easier to bend. But then the steel case battery actually provides a lot of stiffness add more rigidity to the phone, and it also helps protect the battery cells inside. It's also a really interesting shape compared to this one, right? Yeah, a lot of these phone batteries that you'll see in pretty much all other manufacturers will use rectangular battery cells. Apple will have elected to use this, I don't even know what to call this. <laughs> um, there's like this tiny bevel here where the volume button would be or where the camera button is. They've like really squeezed out every last bit of space for the battery inside the phone. I guess this begs the question, like why can't other phone manufacturers do this? Here's the thing. Apple's market share is actually huge. Almost 20% of all mobile phones sold in 2025 were Apple products. You may have noticed that Samsung's market share is technically larger, but that share is spread across a wider range of mobile models. So Apple end up selling more of each individual model. That means Apple can afford to allocate more resources into creating unique parts specific to each of their mobile phones. They've managed to create a smaller, kind of like really refined battery that's super compact and fits very neatly into the puzzle that is their internal components of the phone. But the battery capacity is actually smaller on the Apple iPhone Air batteries compared to nothing or Samsung, etc. The phone that people probably most people would compare this to is the Galaxy Edge, but the Air actually manages to beat it in like a lot of battery life tests. I think one reason they can do this is Apple has like this huge top down control of their whole ecosystem. So for example, like Android, it's owned by Google and then a lot of different phone manufacturers build on top of it. But iOS is owned by Apple and they, it's only built for like Apple phones. So Apple can make like kernel level optimizations. There's more integration between like their hardwares and like software teams, like the chip designers, and it just adds up. And when we talk about chip, is this, is this whole thing 
the chip. No, so this is the main board of the phone. It's actually really small, right? This is like the, the brains of the computer. This fits like probably more computing power than it took for them to get to the moon. La fat. Yeah. Damn. I think a lot of people know that this juts out into the camera bump. It's actually advantageous to put these main boards near the top and the bottom of the phone. A really good way to illustrate this is with a popsicle stick. When we're bending the popsicle stick, you can see that the majority of the curvature is near the middle the ends actually stay relatively quite straight. So these sensitive electronic components are actually more protected from that bending. Basically, if we kept bending that until the point where it snaps, so the chip's here. Yeah. So it's protected. Yeah. Interesting. These are amazing, like how much circuitry they pack into this. This part that Patrick is holding is called the printed circuit board. A very important part which houses over 100 meters of copper and connects all the components in your phone to one another. You can think about it like a small city. Your components would be things like schools, gyms, workplaces, and the proper traces are your roads and pavements connecting them all together. What's really interesting about the PCB in the iPhone Air is the amount of circuitry Apple have managed to squeeze onto a board that's literally the size of a stick of lip balm. Interestingly, this has a bigger surface area than the main board inside the Pro. The reason for that is the PCB inside of the Pro is fully double stacked, whereas inside of the Air, they only have this small component here, which juts into the, the camera bump that is double stacked. So what does double stacked mean? So these PCBs are like a 10 layer PCB. And then what Apple have done is, if you can see here, it's actually a little thicker at the top They've put another PCB here and then a connecting layer, and they've connected those to give them more board space overall. So instead of having two sides where you can put components, now you have four places where you can put components. So I think these are the four different aspects of the phone that they've kind of like optimized to be able to get it this thin, but it all fits into this overall idea of the product, what you put in the phone and what you don't put in the phone. Every product really has its trade-offs. So like in an RPG, when you're building your character, you get a set amount of skill points. You can max out your battery, but then you might be, not be able to max out your size. You can put everything into having like a fast screen, fast processor, amazing battery, but then maybe your price is really high. So they've taken some things away from this phone to be able to make it so thin. It has one camera, one speaker. The chip cannot actually run as fast as in the other phones. So they use the same chip in here like the as the Pro model, but you're probably not gonna get the same performance compared to the Pro because the Pro has a vapor chamber cooling it down so it can run faster. So what we're saying here is like, even though it looks super pretty, there are things that have been taken away in order for it to be this pretty. It would be amazing in the future if like there are no product trade-offs and every product can be like amazingly thin and like you, know, you can pack as much compute as possible into a tiny device. Computer used to take up a whole room in a university, but now you have a computer in your hand. But I think at the current point, this probably doesn't hit the right areas for a lot of consumers. When you think about like a thin phone, what is this really adding to your life? Sure, it's light, it's cool, it's definitely a feat of engineering, but you, you're losing like a lot for most consumers. People who like to take photos, they don't have the three cameras, they don't have their ultra wide, they can't take macro photos. Maybe you use your phone a lot, it's slower, battery life isn't as good, and it costs more too. I feel like for a lot of consumers, this isn't like an obvious choice. So I'm kind of confused as like who this is targeted towards.